I would like to uh, just first start off saying retirement is a good thing. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Look forward to it. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's a new chapter in life and a chapter that can be very rewarding and very fulfilling. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how I prepared for retirement. <clears throat> you have to excuse me. <clears throat> I haven't had my voice for a couple days, so I haven't talked all day. Try to do the best I can. What I'd like to do is share with you my path. It may not be your path or anyone else's path that you talk to about retirement, but I'd like to share with you the process I went through about a year to two years before I actually retired, which was in June, a year and a half ago. So let's uh, look at the handout. Uh, do you have handouts yet? Okay. Uh, those have handouts. If you could pass them out, I'm sorry. <clears throat> As you get the sheet, you can just follow through with me. I'm just going to outline the process that I went through. The very first steps that take place as you prepare for retirement is uh, check out the AdventistRetirement.org website. It's uh, printed there. It talks about both retirement plans uh, prior to 2000 and 2000 post. So you can tell how long you've been in the ministry and you can read and, and uh, learn a fair amount there. The second thing is to notify your supervisor and Connie Starkey at least six months before you retire. Now, you can't come up with a month notice and say, I'd like to retire on February 1st. <clears throat> There's a lot of paperwork that has to take place, especially if you've been in different conferences, different entities, or if your spouse has been employed in different entities. It takes a while to pull all of that together to gather the actual amount of funding that you will receive and what, is, what you're entitled to. So you need to contact your supervisor and Connie at least six months early. So she'll greatly appreciate it and it'll expedite the whole process uh, rather than saying, you know, we have part of the paperwork but we're waiting for paperwork from another institution and so on. So do that. <clears throat> Fill out all the forms for Connie in a timely way. It's not something to put on your desk that you get around to do someday. Do it as quickly as you can and get to her because there's usually questions uh, and things that need to be clarified. <clears throat> Issues to discuss with Connie. <clears throat> if pre vested in, <clears throat> excuse me, if vested in the 2000 plan, she can talk that through with you. I won't go through it in detail. <clears throat> there's <clears throat> the next is financial. <clears throat> Make sure you apply for Medicare Part A at least several months before your retirement and Medicare B and sign up for Social Security. In a nutshell, just go to your local Medicare, your Social Security office, the ones closest to you, and just meet with them and say, this is my plan. <clears throat> Tell me when I do it. And they gave me the dates and I filled it out right on schedule. That way you won't have any surprises. Financial matters. <clears throat> I'm working against the speed of my voice deteriorating. Now, the financial matters. Arrange for insurance to continue. If you're having any deductible in payroll from various insurance companies, such as Aflac and other ones, if you are, be sure that I, I have, thank you, I'll get that one too. Uh, if you are, uh, evaluate if you're going to continue with that same insurance company, and if so, you need to contact them to set up a, a deduction from your bank account or whatever you're going to do. So don't wait until the last month. Uh, make sure that you know what you would like to continue as far as any insurance packages that you already have that will transition because probably they're payroll deductible. And when the payroll ends, uh, you want to make sure that you're covered. Capital investments. Now, this is a big horizon. I'm just going to share with you a couple of things to consider. In the, as you approach the, the last year or two, you want to update any appliances that you have. We were having a problem with our washer. So we said, you know what, let's just buy a new one now. And just before I retired, our dryer was giving us difficulty. We bought a new dryer. So within the last two years, we had a new washer, new dryer. Our previous set had lasted us a long time. The whole purpose of buying capital for our, our home was so that three months after retirement, you got a $500, $800 expenditure. So we did all of this before we actually changed our uh, actual income. So even if it's working, it may be time to pass it on to your, your children or your neighbors or your friends. Uh, get something good so it's in, in good shape and it's one less thing 
to be concerned about. Any electronics? Well, you can't keep up on electronics today. But, you know, if, if you have a TV that takes two people to move around the house, you may want to upgrade. So look at what you need to do. I purchased a, a new computer uh, just before my retirement so that I would have time to get used to it and that I would have it in place and, you know, out of paid for and, and so on. So anything that I was looking at electronically uh, was a good thing to do. Update the car. Uh, the month before I retired, we bought a, another car. Because I said, I don't want to mess with cars later. I don't want to have things going wrong that I'm going to be dinged with on constant finances. So we did car shopping and got in the car. So our car and our, all our household appliances, electronics, everything was new within the last uh, six months to a year uh, prior to retirement. So we weren't going to be faced with those types of uh, financial challenges. Uh, I don't know what you do for fun outside of your pastoral responsibilities. I have hobbies and interests, and uh, I purchased new equipment in my amateur radio, and I was given some as a gift. So I have a combination. My amateur radio station is all new equipment, and it, it will last me for a long time. Uh, what I had before uh, probably should go to the Smithsonian, but I just kind of hang on to it, you know, just the memories of the old days. So if you are engaged or your spouse is engaged in any particular things that require capital adjustments, uh, the time to do it is the year or two before. Uh, it makes it much easier. The obvious part next is any consumer debt that you may have hanging over your head obviously needs to be cleared out well in advance so you aren't having to deal with anything. So that when you conclude your employment at Georgia Cumberland, you have, you know, you're debt free, everything is paid for, everything that you have is relatively new, and you know that you can maintain and, of course, um, be in a much better financial matter. I'm not the expert. You know, Kurt can give you some, some good advice. I'm just telling you my pathway. And I realized, let's make these changes. Let's do all of this my last year and get it taken care of. I prepared a little budget. Excel is one of my favorite software programs. And I prepared a little budget for Jerry Four. And so I have a whole list of uh, sources of expense. And then I have a list of a few sources of income. And uh, I put that together. I didn't have any way to bring it. Uh, but what I do is I have in there uh, $1 for everything. So electricity was a dollar. You know, telephone was a dollar. It's quite obvious it's not real. And the income was $10 because, you know, I had a lot of uh, things that I put money out for. And then all the formulas are there, and it calculates what your monthly balance is and what your... Uh, your funds are. If you want a copy of that, just send an email to Diane Epperson. She has a copy of it. If you play with Excel, you don't need that. But if you like somebody to just have it already put together and you can adjust it, there's plenty of vacant lines for you to play with. <clears throat> I like to talk about lifestyle and preparation for retirement. As you think about retirement, I've observed some of my friends, and uh, some of them have uh, struggled with concluding their employment. Uh, they're capable of working, and they decide to continue working because they haven't developed a life outside of ministry. And so they, they, they go 65, 66, 67, 69, 70, and they're moving right along as they're singing happy birthday. And I say, what are you going to do? Well, well, I'm feeling good. I think I'll keep working. I said, well, what do you want to do when you retire? And we really don't have a conversation because there isn't really a plan or preparation. And so what I would like to address now is the preparation mentally because retirement is a good thing. It's a life that can be filled with joy and to, to not be sure. And so at whatever age and stage you are in life, I hope that you develop and have activities outside of pastoral ministry so that you have a balance in your life besides work and play, and family, and many other things. And so I spent probably a year to a year and a half uh, with Nick Howard, who was my coach. And as I told him, I'm thinking about retiring within the next year and a half or two. And I said, I want to make a preparation, and I've got some ideas. And he said, well, think about this, think about this. And so for the next year of coaching, I worked through the process, and what I worked through are the things that I had right here. And these are talking points for Marilyn and I to just sort through. And by the time we came up to May for retirement, May 31, the day camp meeting closed, of all things, 
when we came to that point, we felt bad because there was a transition taking place and I hadn't been to retirement before, but we were pretty excited and anxious because we'd been talking for a long period of time about what we will do and how we will do it and how it will impact us and our children and so on. So it wasn't like, what do we do? We say, we're ready to go. We'd planned our, our retirement. So we found that very valuable. And these are some things that I continually worked on and talked about every single month. Now, it wasn't monotonous because I'd say, well, maybe we ought to not do that. Maybe we ought to change. And, you know, we went through this dialogue. These are the things that we set some goals in. We tried to establish goals of what we would do with each other. If you don't have to go to work next Monday and your wife has to look at you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday, Sabbath, you know what? You start all over again. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> I'd suggest you have a plan. <laughs> so you don't get in each other's hair. So it's good to be together, but it's also good to have things that you want to do. <clears throat> and I still have on my, on my phone, on my planner, trips and activities that we have planned that have not all taken place because we weren't going to do them all in the first three months. But these are goals that we have now for 2017, some things that didn't get done in 2016. So we worked out. <clears throat> what are the goals that I'd like to do with my wife? We have two children. When I retire, how is that going to impact me? <clears throat> Our son apostatized and moved to California six years ago. Amen. He was bad influence. My daughter moved four years ago to California. <clears throat> so guess what? We make trips to California. So the question is, is how much time do we want to spend with our children? And what do we want to do with our children to still have a positive impact on their life? And so that is a discussion. Because I have a son that I love and a daughter that I love. And I want to see them faithful. And I want to see them valuable in their community and their life and their family. <clears throat> I'm still dad. So how, how is this all going to happen when we're 2,000 miles apart? So we talk through how often do we want to go? What do we want to do when we get there? What are some of the things that we would like to accomplish in the, in the time that we have with our children, which is now more limited than when they lived here? <clears throat> we have three wonderful grandchildren. Gavin just turned 14, eighth grade at Orangeville uh, School in California. He loves sports. And so when we go, we try to go on the days that he's in games. He plays in a soccer team. They have a sports league. Can you imagine? In the Seventh-day Adventist School, they have a sports league where they play other Adventist schools. And I won't debate those issues with you. But <clears throat> so we had tried to arrive on Tuesday or Wednesday for the game on Thursday because I want to be there. He's quarterback. And I want to be there when he's playing. And I, you know, I want those connections. <clears throat> because we've talked through how important it is to be with our grandchildren on certain days. It's graduation is June 1. You know, we, we know what we want to do and we know how we want to impact their lives. Our son has two little girls, three and five. Very impressionable. They're changing fast. But we want grandpa and grandma to be with them at points in time that make a difference in their life. So we are trying to think when we go there, how long do we want to stay? What can we do with them? What can we do with the girls? Well, Lonnie and Monel can go for a walk. We're going to stay with the girls tonight. You go out and spend the evening. Go out together. Go have a date. We want to have the girls alone, just there. Read them stories. Crawl in bed with your grandkids. Read to them. You know, that, that kind of a thing. So all of this is a part of the scheme of events they're a part of our processing. This is what we want to do when we retire. We don't have time to do it very easily now in full time. How are we going to spend our time? <clears throat> travel. How much time do we want to travel out of 12 months? Out of one month, how many weeks would we want to be gone? How many weekends? We didn't get back until very late last night, early this morning from California. We've been gone for four weeks. So that, I had all these issues. So that, that's... Uh, but anyway, we went traveling because it was important to be there for certain times with both of our children in the last month. Hobbies. <clears throat> what, what do we do for interests and hobbies? Well, my wife got an auto harp. Um, I have a mountain dulcimer. But after I retired, I decided to explore and expand this thing up here. And I went into a music store and bought a banjo off the rack. 
still picking away. And that's probably all that will come, come from it. But you know what? It's challenged me to read, to listen to the internet, to go to YouTube, to meet with other people in the music field, asking questions, and it's challenged me in a whole new dimension of my life. So those are things that I'm doing to spend my life to bring joy and fun. How are we going to spend time with our family? I already dressed, volunteering. I decided that I wanted to volunteer when I concluded my full-time work. I didn't want to end ministry. I just wanted to change the ratio of time in ministry. And so I decided that let's take six months and let's just adjust the six months so that we can just recalculate. I can't describe it, but it sure is nice to wake up in the morning without an alarm clock. To walk out to the kitchen table and to sit and eat and visit. And then when we're both finished, we can get up and do what we planned for the day. I tell you, that is a, a mental freedom that's wonderful. Volunteering, I decided I'd wait. After six months, I started volunteering at a food bank in Appleton. There's just a little tiny food bank, really tiny. And I go there on Thursdays and spend several hours. I have a very important job. I cut up the empty boxes that come from the stores. And I get all the cardboard cut up and put it in a big box, all a certain size, and then we take it to recycle. You know what? I love it. Because I'm a pastor there. I'm not a pastor to them. As a pastor, pastor, I'm Jerry. And they started calling me pastor when I came in. I said, nobody call me pastor. Just call me Jerry. I don't want these people. To think. They just think of me as Jerry. So I have prayer periodically with the group when we start for the afternoon. But I help them carry boxes out to their car. Sometimes if it's really crowded, I just mill around and talk to people while they're waiting to go through and pick up their food. After a while, you get to know them and chat with them. And it was just like when I was a pastor and I went to school in the afternoon and all the moms and dads picked up their kids. I go from car to car to car. It's amazing how much can happen in that parking lot at the school. It's amazing what happens in the parking lot in a food bank. So I still get to minister to people. I get to talk to the staff and I just, I just love it. And a box cutter is my tool. You know, it's, it's really nice. Oh, well, you know what? This retirement schedule is pretty tight at the moment. <laughs> uh, uh, well, let me just say quickly, uh, that, is a, that is a big factor that I didn't put on the paper, and that is that I'm controlled by Maryland's and my goals and not by my calendar. Big, big deal. <clears throat> Retirement, if you want to work part-time, you may establish, do I want to do whatever. Okay, I got two minutes. I got to go. Retirement location considerations. I know as a pastor, I was encouraged to spouse, when the spouse passed away, to just sit tight for a little bit. You don't need to move to Florida, California, or Maine. Just sit tight and let all of the emotions and the pain and the readjustment of life take place for a little while. Then you can figure out what to do. We figured we were going to do the same thing. We're going to stay right where we're at, do what we're doing for a period of time. We aren't ready to make any major adjustments in our life. We want to just stay. But we've had a lot of conversation about these items, and I'll just go quickly. Do we want to stay here in the the Chattanooga College Dale area? And if so, how long? Our kids are there. My dad, his health has deteriorated, uh, and then he just passed recently, but that took a lot of time. My brother was a primary caregiver, but I was over there every day at least once, twice a day. Uh, but I felt good because I could give the time to my dad. And um, you want to move. Oh, you know, when we retire, you know where we're going to move? Oh, we're going to move here, or we're going to move there. But you know, as you approach the last year and you think about it and you put all the factors together, you need to be very careful about making that move. Not saying you shouldn't do it, just make sure you, you carefully process it. And then you want to consider, if we move, what about the cost of the location to go to? What about finding new friends? What about new housing? What about leaving our support group behind? What about leaving this whole environment? We've been in College Dale 23 years, Chattanooga, serving in ministry. And so th- these are big factors. Uh, do you want to live split? Do you want to live where we're at now currently for like, four months of the year, and then divide two months here or four months here with our kids and grandkids. You know, how do we want to do all of this? So the, uh, the split calendar is something to process so that we just don't wait, and then all of a sudden the kids beg, come here, come here, whatever. Process ahead of time the best location. 
Do you want to get an RV travel trailer and go for a while? You know, for a month, two months, one year? Uh, what do you want to do in that time? Uh, where to be located is good medical care. Uh, do you live in a place where the nearest hospital is 30 miles away? And if you go to a major, you have a major problem, you've got to go 80 miles away. You know, it depends on the health of you and your spouse. Uh, taking into consideration medical care. Take into consideration parental care, the aging of mom and dad. You know, our decision has been we're going to stay with our parents as long as they're here and give them the best possible care as long as we can. My mom passed away at home. My dad passed away at home. And that's the way we wanted to have it happen. Marilyn's mom is 93. Her husband's 95. They're changing quickly. This is our number one priority right now. We want to give them the best possible care we can uh, until uh, that changes. Let me just share with you this one thought. When I retired, I did not feel that I was quitting the ministry. I felt when I retired from the Georgia Cumberland Conference that I was just realigning the use of the resources that God has given me. So I'm still in ministry, but not at the same ratio. I have more time with Marilyn than I had before. I have more time with my children and grandchildren than I had before. So we're just rebalancing the calendar and the clock and the emotional fulfillment and joy. My life in the last year has been filled with joy. I feel very satisfied and fulfilled in my life. You can do the same. Plan ahead. God has a plan to use you and to use me as long as we are alive on this earth. We may not be employed by the Georgia Cumberland Conference, which I can say has been a privilege for me. 23 years in this conference, 22 years, it has been a joy. But you know what? The Lord is using me today. And Marilyn and I have short ministry experiences with people rather than the longer ones that we have today. So think about retirement. As you get close to it, plan. God will use you. God will bless you. And you will conclude your service on this earth with a heart filled with joy.